Pues a continuación pasamos a la presentación del proyecto piloto del Parlamento Europeo Understanding the Value of a European Game Society. En primer lugar, intervendrá Martin Dawson de la Comisión Europea con el propósito de mostrarnos precisamente eh, cuáles son los principales datos relacionados con el sector del videojuego, con su oferta y con su demanda, a través del Media Outlook que se publicó en las últimas semanas, para luego, a continuación, eh, Tim Fox de la consultora Ecoris y Arthur Legal de la consultora Kea expongan las líneas generales de este proyecto piloto eh, solicitado por el Parlamento Europeo y ejecutado a través de esta consultora eh, a partir del encargo ofrecido por la propia Comisión Europea. Muchas gracias. Okay, well, good afternoon, uh, and uh, also from me, Martin Dawson, from the European Commission uh, unit responsible for audiovisual and media industries. Uh, many congratulations to the Spanish Presidency of the Council of the European Union, and to the Ministry of Culture in particular, and to the Council of Tenerife, and to the industry, the Spanish video games industry, and all those who contributed to the organization of this event and uh, I think this uh, event is uh, gracias. I think this event is very uh, timely uh, as we heard the European Parliament uh, adopted a resolution on video games and esports uh, back in November then in May we in the European Commission uh, adopted this uh, European media industry outlook And as we know, the Spanish presidency uh, has put this high on its agenda. <coughs> And in Paolo, uh, we have been working uh, with our consultants on this pilot project on video games, which we shall hear about soon. So I just wanted to say a few words about the media industry outlook and what it says about video games. So this... Um, is a market study looking at the media ecosystem as a whole because we felt that usually there are separate studies on cinema, separate studies on television, separate study on the news, um, and we felt that it would be important to bring it all together and see the media ecosystem as a whole, to see what uh, interrelations there are between the sectors to see the commonalities, the differences, and have a holistic uh, view. And I'd like to stress this is very much a, med uh, a market analysis. It's not a policy document. We are not making recommendations in this media outlook. We're looking to identify trends in the industry, both as production and as regards consumption, because we also felt, looking at existing literature, that sometimes the consumption dimension Uh, was not uh, that well uh, researched and, and analysed. And I'm looking at the overall media trends, so not only on video games, but including video games. <clears throat> We see that um, media compete in the same attention economy as growth is driven by online players and consumers increasingly shift online as there is increasing connectivity, you know, first it was 3G, then 4G, then 5G, and then in parallel, more and more mobile devices, the smartphones, the laptops that we see in the room here today. Consumers uh, can, uh, on the same screen, choose between many different types of media, many different types of social media and apps, and therefore the competition has never been stronger for their attention, for their time. At the same, and nonetheless, and nonetheless, or because of this, the, uh, there are big differences in the economic uh, revenues, the market revenues between the sectors. So if we look at cinema, 
video games and news media, for example, there are big differences. So we see, looking at the market overall, that the audiovisual sector for this report, we define that as cinema and TV, including, and VOD, is about 90 billion euro. The video game sector is about 23 and a half billion euro in the European Union. This is a study about the European Union market. <clears throat> and the news media, about 20 billion. Um, whilst TV remains the most pref preferred media in general, what these figures show is that video games, as we have heard, have grown and grown to reach a situation where they are in fact bigger than cinema and music put together. This is an interesting finding. We also see that in the COVID uh, lockdown uh, years, for obvious reasons, some sectors such as cinema suffered greatly, whereas uh, video games and video on demand, which were accessible online, they actually grew in, in revenue during the COVID years. So very different trajectories. In terms of trends coming through the media system as a whole, we see that intellectual property is key for producers to maintain their independence. Technology uh, is not, uh, does not stop. Technology is uh, wave after wave changing and uh, bringing new opportunities, whether data, AI, or immersive uh, experiences. And consumer behavior, in particular the younger generations, is driving new business models. Companies are having to react, respond, anticipate to consumer behavior. And I'm turning my pages, but I'm not turning on there. Thank you very much. In this time of change, in this time of change, uh, of course, creative, creative talent is at the heart, but there are new skills and new skill, new combinations of skills that are needed. Not only creativity, not only storytelling, but also tech uh, skills to be able to adapt and make the most of the new technology <clears throat> and management and business skills to put this out on the market, put it out there on the market, reach audiences and monetize. And to do all of this, uh, financial investment is more important than ever because all of that, of course, takes money. It takes investment. So finally, coming down to video games as such. So a thriving market, I could put a thriving market uh, question mark, thriving question mark. On the one hand, we see continuous global growth that other sectors would be envious of, as I said, it's bigger than music and cinema put together. Uh, we see, again, because of the co connectivity, because of the technology, that within video games, mobile games have now overtaken consoles and PC as the main platform for video games. <clears throat> we see that uh, whilst the EU market has grown, nonetheless, its share of global market, because this is very much a global industry, is in fact forecast to drop slightly. And whilst employment grew 12%, in 2020, uh, yeah, a COVID year, employment grew 12% at EU level. Uh, many companies uh, are small, micro, 80% of companies are small and micro, which helps diversity, you could argue, which helps uh, creativity and independence, you could argue. On the other hand, looking at the global picture, we see a domination of the market by non-EU players is the, why well, perhaps there's a question mark. Uh, so only two EU companies are in the global top 20 and they represent less than 2% of the revenues of those companies. At the same time, at global level, we see a trend in consolidation. There were 400 deals in 2021 globally, uh, representing 35 billion euro. 
as companies you know, strategize to keep, retain, or acquire new talent, new technology, or popular games. And a headline example, of course, is the Microsoft Activision Blizzard uh, attempted uh, merger, which is still ongoing, and which has to pass regulatory hurdles in the EU, in the US, and in the UK. Uh, a merger of the value of 75 billion euro. So really, uh, we are talking very important economic players. So just to graphically represent the growth of the European video games revenues. Uh, in orange is the physical games, in blue is the digital games. So as we heard, video games are intrinsically digital uh, and the digital pro proportion has increased significantly. This is the list of top video games companies, of which uh, one, uh, Ubisoft from France, uh, is uh, 13th. Now, coming to the consumer side, uh, we all play, as we have said, as the speakers have said quite rightly, um, video games have now become mainstream part of popular culture. It's not just about teenagers, it's not just about kids. Uh, all population segments, about 40% of the world population by 2025 is forecast to play. In Europe, uh, estimates range from about 30% to 50%. So men and women, uh, so a very diverse uh, demographic. It's uh, a nice picture there from Isfa, um, showing the rain. All demographics are involved there. And the video games industry is a very dynamic uh, industry, again, as the speakers before me uh, pointed out, um, quite restless always innovating, always changing. In terms of business models, uh, subscription model is uh, growing. We see streaming companies, VOD streaming companies now, also streaming video games. We see in-game purchases, microtransactions, ad-supported gaming. So they're constantly experimenting with the business side as well, uh, in terms of monetization uh, online. And game developers are selling directly to uh, app stores, uh, bypassing publishers. And we see a rise of cloud gaming. So the hardware becomes less and less important as uh, the, 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 the games are stored uh, in the cloud. And in terms of content, in terms of content, there are many dynamic trends as well. Uh, in particular, transmedia IP adaptations. So video game adaptations to film and TV series, whether it's Witcher or The, the, uh, the Last of Us. Or others, there's been an increase by 47% uh, between 21 and 22 worldwide. So that makes IP retention more and more uh, valuable and strategic uh, asset. We see that uh, US companies in particular are leading, but that some uh, European companies are also following, such as Embracer, the Swedish company, which has recently bought the rights for uh, Lord of the Rings and is developing content uh, uh, in many different uh, platforms, through many different platforms, video games, and more and more. And we see that video games are also a gateway to, to virtual worlds. We see that they have provided whole communities of uh, players access to virtual reality through 2D screens in games such as Minecraft and Roblox, where we see that games are more than games. Games have become a venue for social interaction, where you meet people, where you make friends, and where you even can go to a, a concert, a music concert. And this, of course, has also attracted uh, companies across the culture and creative sectors, so that uh, the lines between gaming, music, social media, fashion are blurring as companies come to this space uh, and, and develop goods uh, and services. 
So I've spoken enough, but uh, there is uh, very much going on. And in the following panels, I hope we'll also have a chance to talk about video games and um, virtual reality, which is a new emerging uh, dimension for video games, where video games are a center of technological development. And also virtual production, which is an interesting spillover, where some of the technology which has been developed can also be used for film uh, and TV uh, production. Thank you very much, and I'll pass the floor now to the team on the pilot project. Thank you. Okay, hello, good afternoon everyone. It's good to see everyone here. Thanks ever so much for inviting us. Um, my name is Tim Fox and I'm a director of a company called Acorus and this is Arthur Legault, who's a director of KEA. And we were commissioned to do a study um, on the EU Video Games Society by DG Connect of the European Commission. And today is our sort of first chance to give you a preview of the main findings. So we're gonna run through briefly the aims and the methodology of the, of the study, but then we're going to talk to you about the main findings and the recommendations that come from it, and obviously happy to answer any questions directly after this session or throughout um, this afternoon or tomorrow. So briefly in terms of the, the aims, so we were commissioned to, to really look at four main areas. So... The first was, was basically to get a better understanding of the EU's video game sector, really. So th there is intelligence out there, there is data out there, a lot of people have done a fair amount of research, but to be honest, the, the sector is under-researched, so recognising the importance of the sector, the size of the sector, there isn't a huge amount of evidence and data out there, particularly compared to other sectors that are, are often quite smaller, really. So our study was filling that gap and getting that evidence base and getting a better understanding of what the sector is, its characteristics, how it's composed, uh, what makes up the sector, and also the issues and the opportunities and the challenges that are faced by the, the sector. Also, we're looking at how the sector impacts on different EU policy areas. So we've heard today about sort of the economic side of things, but the cultural side, the education side, the health side. So we looked at video games through different angles to look at how, how the, the video game sector contributes to those different policy areas. We also wanted to look at, and this is a key focus, really what, what needs to happen, so the recommendations really. And this, isn't, this was commissioned by the European Commission, but this study is definitely not just for the European Commission. The recommendations are very much for the sector, uh, for sector representation and also EU, EU policy as well. So it's a broad set of sort of recommendations across a range of different stakeholders. And then the last one is really starting to nurture that, that network of actors. So, so th th there are communities out there, policymakers um, have, have um, relationships with those communities, but we spoke to a huge amount of people, which I'll talk about in a moment, to, to really, again, it was mentioned earlier, start that conversation to help um, develop and implement the recommendations and help, again, to, to further the research uh, and, and knowledge. And we looked at four market areas. So we had a sector overview. So Arthur will talk about the kind of the, the characteristics, the trends and the key players within the sector. We looked at financing, so what are the financing needs of the sector going beyond just saying the sector needs more finance to look at which bits of the sector need it, what type of finance and what for. We looked at the regulatory environment, so looking at how the um, how regulations, because it, it covers a lot of different regulations, thinking about the goods and services of the sector, so how the regulations sort of impact on, on the sector. 
We looked at employment and education needs, so looking at things like um, skills needs, labour shortages, uh, labour force issues, employment trends, and then lastly, as we've heard again, recognising that, that video games have got an artistic and creative dimension, they're an art form, we looked at video games through the lens of, lens of, of culture. So just briefly in terms of the research methodology, at its heart is us speaking to a huge amount of video games sector organisations. So we talked to over 400 companies within the EU sector. So yes, we talked to policy makers and representative organisations and they were incredibly helpful, but, but this research has come from the sector itself and we used a range of different methodologies to, to really... Um, to speak to them in, in a meaningful way. So, we, for instance, we did 12 workshops, which together they were sort of um, attended by over 300 individuals. Uh, these were meaningful workshops, so they weren't sort of, it wasn't a quick survey, it was often sort of one to two hour conversations with, with, with up to sort of 30, 40 individuals with breakout groups, speakers, um, and different sorts of interaction to ensure that the, the sector had, had its voice. We also talk, did interviews, again, with very, very small uh, one-woman or one-man bands through to very large, the largest EU uh, video games companies. We did a short survey to give that sort of quantitative element, and also we did a literature review. So using that data, using the research that, that is out there, but, but fundamentally, this study is really built on, on primary research. And then the report, which we will produce next month, uh, it's about 200 pages long, so we're not going to be... We're, today we're just talking about the sort of main salient points from the research and we'd need two hours rather than 20 minutes to deal with it but but really it's a detailed report that has the findings and the recommendations right over to arthur thanks tim and um yep sorry um, this was really a team effort as well between the careers, between KA, uh, with the sector we, that we consulted a lot. So I'm going to run you through sh some of the sh chapters that we produced, um, starting with the market overview and financing. So what is happening on the video game sector in Europe, with of course some global comparison, etc. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go into all the details because there was already there were already some elements presented, but um, just the key figures. We are talking about a large industry, uh, globally uh, reaching around 180 billion euros of revenues, growing as well, growing in Europe and growing globally. In fact, even growing faster at a global scale. Um, if we look at the EU market, we are looking at a roughly 23.5 billion euros industry. Um, and a more or less stable global market share, although the forecasts are expecting it to slightly decline because the, the African, American, and Asian markets are growing faster. We are looking at a sector which is um, roughly 4,600 companies, roughly 90,000 90, people, but this has a lot of data gaps as well. So where the, the, the figures on revenues turnover are quite, um, um, let's say, established, but when it comes to number of companies, number of um, employees, this is much less researched, and there are lots of issues with the data sources when it comes to that. We'll discuss also that a bit later. Um, so it's been said the industry is growing. Um, I'll confirm it briefly. Uh, I think that, that that's fine. We'll show some, some slides on this as well. Um, but most importantly, it's shifting as well. We, we, it's shifting within the industry with new business models, new value chain dynamics. Um, we are looking at games as a service, so soft launch plus development of the product over time, which enable developers to monetize um, their games while still working on it. We are looking at subscription models, which gives more steady revenues over time. We are talking about in-game uh, ads or ad-supported business models. So we are looking also at diversification of types of revenues. We are looking also at microtransaction, which is also uh, and DLC and other types of revenues that really strengthen this sort of um, way um, monetization time of vid video games. So we are looking at industries which are not just one uh, one of purchases, but really monetiz monetizing that content over time. 
Um, now, when we look at sort of the characteristics of the video games industry, um, first, it's a lot of small and mid-sized game developers, and of course, size of the company is not um, the only metrics by which you should judge a company. There are lots of freelancers as well um, in the sector, but still, um, in terms of employment, we are looking at companies with uh, less than 10 employees. Another feature of that is that the company, video game companies in Europe mainly rely on self-financing, so on the own revenues that generate rather than external sources of revenues, be they uh, financing, sorry, be they public or private. So that's also an important component to look at. Um, Martin's presentation already covered it, but um, there are some technologies that are also enabling new market segments, so um, AR, VR, cloud gaming, and um, which is not notably powered by, um, let's say, new ICT um, innovations. But also, perhaps importantly, we are looking at video games as a sector which is developing really ancillary activities. So we are looking at live streaming, we are looking at esports, for instance. So it's generating value be beyond the video game products themselves. Um, and this is also something that we see as uh, shaping a bit the market. We see also some, let's say, companies external to the sector gradually investing in them. And that, that has been the case for a long time. We've seen, let's say, um, large, let's say, ICT companies entering the video games market. We see that also with other content industries investing in video games, such as Netflix, for instance. Okay, we, you've seen this, uh, this first part of the slide, and um, I'm just going to talk about the second part, which is still on the split between digital video games and um, physically sold video games, but looking at a bit more in details at different, let's say, type of metrics, like uh, the growth of cloud gaming, the growth of gaming networks, which is um, PS Plus, uh, Xbox Live, and this kind of services. Um, but of all the overwhelming um, growth of the mobile gaming segment, which is really driving the market forward. All of the market segments are kind of growing. Um, even the, the physical, physical market is still sort of keeping its, more or less keeping its, its uh, current value. But mobile gaming is really driving the growth at the moment in the industry. On gamers, I'm not going to say much because this was very well covered um, by previous presenters, but just saying two things. One is that, three things. One is uh, it's a roughly equal split between men and women in terms of who plays video games. Second thing is that we are looking at non -kid, uh, well, uh, more, more or less an adult audience as well. So video game uh, players are mostly um, uh, more than 18 years old. Last thing I would say is also on both in terms of number of players and in terms of time spent playing video games per week, we are more or less returning to pre-COVID standards. So when you look at the data, you see sometimes some slight decrease after COVID, but that's more kind of a returning to normal growth rather than anything else. And the report also looked at several, let's say, tech trends, how they affect the market, how they are um, for, uh, expected to grow. Um, on this one, I'll cover just cloud gaming, but we also look at uh, AR, VR. We also look at um, other, other, let's say, uh, trends affecting the video games market. So here, what you see as well on cloud gaming is that we are really at the beginning of the curve, uh, at least that is what is um, expected. So when you, when you look at 2022 data, we are really at the beginning of the slope and um, the market is really expecting to grow very quickly from now on, both in terms of users and in terms of revenues. <coughs> there are many more elements covered in the report. We are looking at um, all of that. We are looking also at private, uh, public and private financing uh, mechanisms out there in Europe not necessarily doing a whole mapping of everything that is, exists in Europe, but looking at the key elements, the key types of funding, tax shelters, direct grants, but also private financing, um, be it in terms of loans and equity, but also in terms of merger and acquisitions within the sector. Um, and out of all of that, we have handpicked really a few key points, really not so many. The first one is exactly on this aspect, on financing. Um, here what we see is that there is a lot going on in the market, be it in terms of how the industry finances itself, be it in terms of 
how um, let's say um, the growth of revenues enable game developers to uh, focus on let's say new franchise new games IP but when we look at really one of the key gap um, at EU level especially is really untargeted financing for the competitiveness of the sector with a specific focus on scaling up emerging companies meaning companies that have developed one or two successful games but that really need the push to grow their activities on a much larger scale. Um, we're also looking at more seed funding options but more at national level, that, that, that's a bit of a different story. Um, <clears throat> and the focus is really also on using private investors, well, working with private investors, unlocking uh, private um, money for the sector, op but also opening up existing funding instruments, so not necessarily reinventing the wheel, creating a new um, scheme for video games, but rather looking at existing funding for startups, scale-ups, and see exactly how that could be better channeled towards the video game sector. So that's really what we are looking at in this recommendation. The second one is probably something that anyone doing research in um, video games have, has been confronted with. It's the level of data is not always great. This is mainly due to the way um, um, official statistics are structured, so we are recommending uh, to improve that through uh, different ways. So it's a bit technical, but it's about better including uh, video games in existing um, statistical frameworks. That was the market overview. Um, I'll go a bit quicker on that, on that one, which is on the regulatory environment. It's not that it's not interesting. Uh, it pr probably requires even more time to discuss. But um, here, we, the key message is really quite simple, I would say. Um, and the simple message is that it, this is complex. <laughs> Video games are complex products. They are cultural content. They are tech-driven. Uh, they're also, um, let's say, a gathering online communities. So there is a sort of consumer-facing dimension. They are um, also data-intensive. So they are, uh, of course, um, um, let's say, subject to regulations and uh, data protection and so on. They are also digital services. So they are really at the crossroads between many different um, areas and many different, let's say, regulatory frameworks. And if you sort of unpack that complexity a bit, if you look at, for example, intellectual property, um, well, there again, you find some different layers uh, of, of complexities because um, video games are not only about copyright. They are also protect potentially protected by trademarks, by design protection, by patent protection. So there are different types of, um, let's say, intellectual property rights that may be encapsulated within a game. I'll show you a bit of an overview um, afterwards. When you look at enforcement of this complex uh, legal environment, overall, well, there are still issues, um, certainly not as important as what we had, uh, let's say, um, in the early 2000s, let's say. Um, where you had uh, many more issues around piracies, but here you still have issues around, for example, copycat games, so games that are cloning uh, the content of another game and that are also released on, on various um, e-shops or app stores. So, and here the litigation processes are um, more complex than the sort of recreation of a game, so that becomes a bit of um, a, um, an issue for uh, game developers to enforce the rights, really. Um, we looked also at different things, including antitrust law. So we mentioned the um, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard merger, um, acquisition, sorry. Uh, we also looked at past cases, more on the geo restrictions of, um, of some eShop games. And we, also, and we looked at all of that. And the overall, let's say, outcome of that is that overall there is no strong competition issue in the sector. However, there are sort of emerging market segments which are much smaller and that can be sort of more strongly affected by, um, let's say, anti-competitive behaviors. We looked at state aid, um, tax shelter schemes. We, well, several colleagues mentioned that before, but th there is clearly uh, something to be, um, let's say, uh, reconsidered here, it is that there is a clear call for that. Um, 
and we also looked at the more, let's say, commercial practices and consumer protection dimension. So here, uh, I'll mention a few things. Uh, that there are many, many elements uh, in the report. We looked at product safety, we looked at uh, different, let's say, elements, but, and we look also quite deeply at um, protection of minors. But if I had to give you two, three snapshots of what we found is that there are lots of developments that are really sort of strengthening the um, online environment and the commercial practices in which video games operate. There is notably this guidance on unfair commercial practices directive, which is really um, helping out in terms of setting out transparency principles for loot boxes, for instance, but also clarifying the sort of rules surrounding in-game advertising. So how you can use that um, in, the, in a rightful way, how you to prevent, let's say, um, more um, aggressive uh, commercial behaviors that would sort of prompt the user to spend more uh, spent in a sort of uncontrollable way. So all of that has been designed at EU level, but also in cooperation with the industry itself. Um, there are still probably some, some, some things that need to be investigated around online content moderation, how to manage online communities. There are still um, issues that video games is, are not, let's say, um, free from, as many other online environments as well um, uh, that are facing issue with this kind of content moderation and how to have a sort of safe um, space um, in a sort of uh, online world. Something quite important as well, I think many of you will mention this um, uh, bit in these two days, but the industry is looking at these issues seriously. We are looking at, um, there is notably the PEGI online, um, the, the PEGI um, self-regulation, which is really a sort of self-standard to better protect um, minors, better protect consumers. And this is really um, a crucial element that sort of um, uh, helps the the video game sector to be a safer space as much as possible. As you can see, we are touching about a broad range of, um, uh, of, let's say, regulatory frameworks. I should have mentioned also some, something around privacy, for instance, so we, we, and data protection. So we, we, we have really looked at that in a, in a sort of broad and holistic way and looked at how um, video games are affected by several uh, regulatory frameworks. Um, just wanted to go back quickly to that slide, which is a sort of overview, brief overview, it's a bit more detailed also in the report on what are the different components of a video games, what kind of, um, what, who are the authors or creators behind them, and what kind of intellectual property framework can protect these particular elements of the games. Not going to go into the details of each uh, boxes of this table, but I just wanted to flag here that different, different, let's say, elements can be protected in different way, and then litigations need to be uh, pursued accordingly. So this can be quite complex for video game developers. Um, and this is also a bit what is sort of um, understood by the quote that you see on the right of this slide, uh, which is about um, how, um, how the Court of Justice of the EU has defined uh, uh, video games, so including both the software dimension, but also its unique creative value um, and the original uh, creation that is a video games. Okay, recommendations um, on this. I think I'll start with the second one, which is really, di really directly linked to what I just said, which is video games are complex. Um, many video game companies are small. Some of them don't have legal staff. There is a need to sort of um, have a sort of guidance around that. So we call that a policy and regulatory lighthouse for small businesses to more easily navigate regulatory requirements. So that could be done um, by the, also the industry trade associations. They are already sort of doing that in some ways, but sort of having a bit of a more systematic approach and guidance on that could be really um, helpful. We are also looking at um, existing, let's say, uh, initiatives like the European um, Enterprise Network that could help also to look at cross-border requirements and help smaller players to navigate um, all, this, uh, all this complexity. 
That's one thing. The second thing is on um, state aid. That was mentioned by several colleagues before. Um, we came to the same conclusion. Um, there is a clear call to adopt uh, state aid provisions at national level. Um, and there is, um, let's say, there are some clear cases that show the complexity of doing that at the moment. So we call for yeah, indeed the revision of um, the global general block exemption regulations or um, specific communications to clarify um, the status of video games in, in, in this context. Um, but perhaps most importantly, what we see, and this is something that was said by colleagues before, we see this pilot project very much as part of a starting point towards a broader movement where um, policymakers, video game sector, come together more regularly and have this dialogue to make sure that um, all these, let's say, regulations that I mentioned, 90% of them are not focusing on video games. For the video games is kind of um, um, almost a sort of by, um, byproduct, let's say, is affected as a byproduct of this legislation. So there, there, it is fine, but there is probably a need to have a sort of dialogue more regularly to make sure that um, this sort of um, issue, uh, well, new regulatory frameworks are properly discussed and taken on board. And this is something that needs to take place at all levels, at EU level, of course, but also um, at national level um, and uh, as well. And this is not only probably about the regulatory framework, it's also how we shape the future policy, the how we sort of act on the um, different strategic elements affecting video games in the future. So that's a really important recommendation as well, which is kind of cross-cutting um, for all the market papers that we've done. And I'll switch to Tim for the next one, which is on. Hang on, we're not done yet. Okay, um, so, the next theme um, we looked at is employment and education uh, needs of the, the sector, so the video game sector in the EU. As we've heard, employment levels are predicted to increase, so about by about 12%. Uh, but if you look in certain member states, those levels are going to, well, according to some statistics like Poland, for instance, they're suggesting that their levels of uh, employment in the sector will increase by about 25% uh, every year. Um, so significant growth despite some layoffs so obviously there's been relatively high levels of uh, redundancies and other uh, job cuts within the IT sector and obviously that has affected the video game sector but when we spoke to video games companies both small and large they were relatively buoyant and confident in terms of increasing employment in the in the future in terms of where workers, how workers sort of enter the, the sector. So obviously they enter through traditional education provision, particularly HE and FE, and actually we found that the provision across Europe, even though we didn't map it, was generally that the, the amount of provision was relatively good uh, from both the public sector and the private sector. But definitely the amount of individuals that come into the sector through the self-taught uh, route uh, is, was an interesting sort of area that both employees and employers that we spoke to highlighted really. So them self-teaching, particularly through online um, learning, and particularly in the last couple of years, that online learning to teach them the basics or the fundamentals of video games design has actually improved quite a lot. And remember, a lot of it is either free or very cheap, so you don't need to spend 5,000 euros a, a term or a semester to, to access it doesn't give you everything, but as a, as a free resource to encourage more people to enter the sector, the self-learning element is, is an important aspect to, to look at. Statistics that we've collected, but also backed up by other surveys, suggest that skills and, and talent shortages, so basically skills and labour shortages, is pretty uh, significant within the sector. So about 40% of companies say it's really hard to, to find the individuals they need. Yes, it's the skill shortage is in the sort of technical roles like artists, game pro uh, programmers, data analysts and designers. So the technical aspect is, is a shortage. But interestingly, a lot of the companies we were saying 
uh, also the sort of softer skills, so the sort of team working, commercialization, the financial planning. So, uh, you know, people were sort of saying, we actually have got the technical skills we need, but these individuals don't have the, the soft skills that, that, that we need as a business, really. So skill shortages, it was often the, 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 often the main sort of barrier to, to growth, which is definitely worth recognizing. Also sort of linked to that, and maybe one of the reasons for that is that obviously the fast changing needs and the technological development meant that the education provision within Europe was often catching up really and finding it quite hard to remain relevant. So we heard from companies, again, both big and small, who said their sort of recent graduates were sometimes sort of educated or trained on the wrong type of software that the industry doesn't necessarily use anymore. Um, that there's less practical elements to the provision within Europe and that, that does sort of damage the, 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 the added value of the, the recent graduates. Um, and and I, and I suppose the, 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 the basic thing we found really is that the collaboration between the sector and educationalists isn't that particularly strong, particularly compared to other uh, IT and other sort of technological sectors really. And that isn't to say that the... Um, education provision isn't trying it's also again going back to the role of the sector here that the sector also needs to help the education provision to become relevant so in terms of engaging that could be as simple as more placements guest lecturing you know there are examples of sort of strategic partnerships with some of the sort of medium size video games companies and the local university coming together to have that strategic partnership but to be honest there wasn't a huge amount of sort of evidence out there that 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 really was sort of significant, really. So getting the educationists and the, the sector to talk to each other a bit more, particularly in terms of things like curricular development, was, 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 was quite key. Because most of the companies are small, so 80% employ less than 10 people, the amount of temporary and freelance staff that the sector uses is quite significant. And although that lends itself partly to the, the project-based nature of the sector, i.e. when a game is being developed, it's, it's a project that doesn't necessarily continue, and particularly the small companies don't necessarily have five games that are developing at any one time. So having a freelance or a, a temporary workforce isn't, isn't potentially a bad thing, but again, it does have those limits in terms of the opportunities for the sector to, to train and develop its own staff when they're thinking more short-term. And then the last one, again, I could spend, speak for an hour, really, but in terms of inclusive and diversity, really. So the sector has improved. So there is, you know, there, there was a lot of high-profile cases in terms of um, lack of diversity, lack of inclusion. Those cases are still around, but I think the sector kind of realises that now. I'm sure a lot of the sector did previously, really, but there's a lot more activity going on, particularly at the company level, but also sometimes at the member of state level to help companies become more inclusive and, and, and diverse. So in terms of the recommendations, um, really fourfold here, and again, the report will have more detail into it. So that more strategic dialogue between those designing and delivering education revision and the industry itself. And the report puts forward different suggestions in terms of sort of structured dialogue, but also just ad hoc dialogue to make sure that the two, the two sectors meet. More active involvement of the sector in existing education and skills initiatives. So what, what, what we were, again, Arthur sort of mentioned about not reinventing the wheel really, is that there is a huge amount of existing skills and labor development and workforce development uh, initiatives out there and we didn't again map them and, and look at the extent to which uh, video games companies interact with all of them but when we looked at it on a, a case study basis we didn't see a huge amount of video games companies engaging with these existing um, sector initiatives so to give you examples on the eu level so there's a digital skills uh, and Jobs Coalition, which is a coalition between member states, uh, companies, uh, social partners and education providers to come together to talk about digital skills shortages. And the representation of the video game sector within that, that coalition is, is quite, quite low. The same for the EU Pact for Skills, which some of you may have heard of, but again, th there's a, a culture and creative sector partnership uh, that looks at reskilling uh, an upskilling for the digital uh, market and again the video game sector isn't necessarily engaged in that really so again it's just about making sure that the the sector is is putting its voice forward to to tackle some of the shortages that it's highlighting 
And then the last one, well, the, the, the second to last one is about promoting positive role models, really. So again, some, some companies are doing that in terms of promoting uh, underrepresentative groups, but again, perhaps more could be done. And then the last one, which is about making sure that companies focus uh, training on raising awareness on inclusive practices. So just to give you a, a, a sort of ad hoc example, so I spoke to someone, uh, a small company in Digital Dragons in Krakow, uh, and you know he was saying that five years ago it was him and his two friends that set up this company. Um, it went really well. Within five years, there was 35 individuals working for him. And, and he, was, he was saying, look, I'm brilliant in terms of understanding uh, the market, consumers, designing. But in terms of running a company to think about inclusivity, diversity, gender equality, he, he doesn't have that. And particularly because he's, been, he's, he's grown from three, three, him and his two friends, to th suddenly 35 people. Again, there's an idea that really that they need su support to, to help them grow um, in, a, in an inclusive way, really. So that's the employment and education. And the last one. Yeah, we're almost done. Um, last chapter. This one is um, perhaps a bit the broader one as well. It's on the cultural, social, and educational dimensions of video games. And, but if I had to sum it up in two words, um, w well, two sentences, um, one is video games as culture. So really looking at how video games are becoming recognized as a cultural and creative sector, how it is also becoming part of the cultural, of, of the cultural industries, in, both in terms of, let's say, spillovers, but also in terms of um, artworks becoming parts of cultural heritage, between, becoming parts of uh, museums curation as well, cur curatorial practices. Video games as culture. Then video games for culture, which is more around um, what are the impacts of video games in our society, be it in terms of, um, let's say, uh, promote education, education and learning. What are, what's the impact of video games there? And we are looking into the um, potential positive impacts and negative as well. We try to, to look at all sides uh, every time, but um, the, the impacts of video games in learning new skills, including, of course, uh, languages, but also problem solving skills. So we look at existing evidence around that. <clears throat> we look at also the impact of games and society in terms of health and well being. So we look at uh, that's probably a field that we, you're quite familiar with, but we are looking at the um, impact on, uh, in terms of health recovery and brain functions, for instance, but also on how video games can supplement traditional care. So we are looking at, at all these sort of elements and how um, games sort of contributes to society beyond uh, its sector itself. Um, I think one thing we saw also, which is not new, but which probably was uh, grew even bigger with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and the virus lockdowns is how online communities gather around games. And that, that has always been the case, even before, um, online, com uh, before online gaming, in fact, there were, there were already gamer communities. But the fact that um, people were stuck at home certainly sort of boosted the role of video games uh, uh, in, uh, and, and in terms of um, them nurturing uh, communities where people exchange. Um, uh, on various uh, things. So beyond video games again. Um, one thing f on society as well is of course the sort of um, environmental footprint as well of the sector. That th there has been lots of discussions recently around um, the footprint of digital services, mainly focusing on VOD services for now, but um, video games are certainly part of this discussion. So what we see is two, two main things. One is on the hardware side, which is probably still the main, uh, let's say, um, impact on the environment of video games. There is a sort of voluntary agreement under the Eco-Design Directive, which is sort of curbing the, um, let's say, environmental footprint of video game consoles while still um, enabling them to improve their performances. So that's one thing. And then there are some, some sector-driven initiatives like Playing for the Planet that you might have heard of 
which is um, initiated both by UNEP, the um, United Nations uh, uh, for Agency for Environmental Protection, and the video game sector itself. So they are initiating huge game jams that engage with more than 130 million people um, around um, content that raise awareness on the um, uh, and, and tries to, to sort of initiate positive behaviors um, uh, towards the environment. Um, so there are many, many things we are covering, and, and I'm probably forgetting one or two aspects that we are looking at in um, in this part of the report, but we are looking quite a, at all the impacts of video games on society. Um, the last thing I would probably say is that when we look at video games as culture, so okay, it's become part of the cultural and creative sectors, it's, become, it's becoming part of policies as well. Um, but something I haven't mentioned yet is that video games are also part of cultural heritage, a form of cultural heritage, sorry. So there is also quite a lot of um, considerations around video games preservation and safeguarding. And that's some, something that we're also covering in, in the report, looking at the um, legal issues around that, as well as the, uh, let's say, uh, technological uh, issue, challenges that they bring. I'm almost done, but I just wanted to zoom in a bit on um, video game spillovers that has been discussed a bit, um, notably for the audiovisual and the music sector. So we discussed in-game concerts in, in, in previous presentations, as well as sort of transmedia IP uh, strategy um, uh, video games sort of becoming films and vice versa. Um, so this is really, well, it's growing not necessarily in terms of number, but probably in terms of um, large successes. Um, so that's one thing. We haven't mentioned some other sectors, but fashion, design, um, the art markets are also looking at video games as an, an environment to promote their work, so that's also happening. Um, video games see, being seen as platform also for um, effective marketing strategies. That's an important component. Um, but probably two things that haven't yet been mentioned is one, the spillover and tourism as well. So the most well-known example is probably the Assassin's Creed saga that takes place in various um, historical places. And that is even organizing discovery tours around um, the places that, you, that are used in the video games in real life. Um, and also the fact that video games and gamification practices are really becoming part of the cultural heritage sector. That's also an important dimension that we see um, emerging. So what do we recommend in this, um, in this quite uh, broad panorama? Two things. Uh, first, cross-sectorial collaboration. They are happening, as we saw. But um, there is room to sort of strengthen the collaboration there and simply to get to know better what the video game sector can offer and vice versa how other cultural and creative industries can contribute um, to the video game sector. So we are looking at how to best showcase this, um, looking both at, let's say, um, existing video game sector conferences, so you all know them, the, the, the big um, um, game uh, shows that uh, are happening throughout the year, kind of opening them up a bit more to other sectors to, um, let's say, foster cooperation and showcase what can be done when different sectors work together. Um, that That's one thing, but also um, vice versa, opening up some, uh, let's say, other sectors' events to uh, more broadly to the video game sector. So, for example, looking at health and video games could be one, um, one uh, let's say, landmark example. The other thing is more on the games as culture uh, dimension. So, we already discussed state aid in previous uh, slides, but there is also something on the safeguarding of video games as cultural heritage. And that is quite complex because safeguarding and, and preservation techniques require quite a number of, um, let's say, criteria. First, on the legal side, there is a sort of dedicated exception in the copyright directive on that. It's looking at how, um, let's say, museums but, and cultural heritage institutions can, let's say, um, benefit from exep exception to copyright in order to preserve um, cultural heritage. So that could potentially cover video games. 
But also importantly, when you look at video games, it's not only about preserving one game, but it's also about preserving um, the hardware and software necessary to run them. And ideally, also preserving the conditions that were the same conditions as uh, when the game was played at the time, so potentially uh, online environments as well. So there are quite a lot of complexity here. We are not necessarily um, suggesting a whole um, broad approach on that, but we are looking at two things. One is standard licensing agreements, something that could work both for cultural heritage institutions companies that are, let's say, investing in, uh, let's say, the preservation of video games and uh, rights holders, so video games uh, developers and publishers. Uh, so that's one thing, something that would bring all of these stakeholders around the same table. And also a bit more partnership development with heritage institutions, which would be crucial in order to preserve games as cultural heritage in the long term. Um, we also suggest doing a sort of more on, on the long term, term the, the, an analysis of the copyright exception to see if that works um, properly or not. But that, that would be the main things that we look at. We are um, looking more at nurturing uh, what is already out there and empowering, let's say, the, the, the video game sector rather than, um, um, let's say, doing something entirely new. It's more yeah, strengthening the existing cooperation and making the most of video games for society here. And I think this concludes our presentation. I would like to thank very much the organizers of the conference, the Spanish presidency, um, the government of the Tenerife Islands as well, uh, for having us here. Looking forward to discussing with you either right now or also in the coming sessions and, and days. We are here with you for the whole two days, so happy to answer any question you may have. I think I'm looking at the organizers here to see if we still have time for Q&A or how it looks like. And of course, that also applies if you have questions for Martin as well. That, yeah. Um, can, can we still take a few minutes for questions and answers? I'm looking at, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. Okay. I would like to thank the, the Spanish presidency for organizing this conference. I have a question for a course. First of all, thank you very much for your insightful presentation and I'm looking forward to reading your report next week. Um, next month, okay, next month. Um, you highlighted uh, several times that there are 70% of companies that have less than 10 employees and that they're struggling and relying on self-financing. And then as a recommendation, you said, you suggested this targeted financing that consists of um, private investments and existing EU funds and national funds. I was just wondering because at the, at the beginning you mentioned you talked to 400 companies and you had uh, 12 workshops. I was just wondering, uh, in your communication and research, were there any new fresh ideas raised regarding financing? Because what you mentioned already exists. Thank you. Well, uh, should, I, should I take this one? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, um, I think what we mentioned already exists, yes and no, because when we talk about private investment, of course it exists, but it's not channeled to video games. So we are talking about instruments that would sort of leverage um, uh, private investments towards the sector. Ho what could this look like? It could lo look like different things. One is capacity building, so training, um, let's say, private investors to understand the sector and to better see the market opportunity. It could be pitching and networking. That's probably not new, but having more connections with the private investors and the video game sectors. That's the second thing. And the third thing could be around, um, let's say, public-private investments as well. So leveraging private investments through public support. Um, those things are not happening at the moment, or at least not sufficiently happening. So that's one thing. There were also some discussions. We, we, we haven't necessarily included them in recommendations, but there were discussions around co-productions, for example, for 
um, co-production funding for video games. So instead of funding one company, the idea would be to, to have some, some more European co-financing. So that there, there are also emerging ideas that could, could be also further discussed and potentially taken up at a later stage. I wouldn't, s and then if you look at the last thing, I would say that what we see as well in the sector is um, the emergence of incubators and, ac and some accelerators, but it's quite new in, well, the growth of these schemes is quite new in the sector. So they ha they have, there has been some of them for quite a while, but now we see more and more of, th of them in this kind of combination of um, spaces, advice and seed funding for video games can, can also be helpful. It's not necessarily new, but it's more about scaling what's already happening and working, I would say. Does that more or less, yeah. But if you have more new ideas as well, we are happy to hear that you discuss them as well, of course. Yeah. Oh, I think there are two. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, hello. Thank you so much for the presentation. It has been quite insightful. Um, I have many questions, but I'm going to do just one so my colleague can also ask. Um, I was really pleased to see that you talk about uh, IP rights and the complexity that we can find in video games. And I just want to know if, for example, one of the recommendations, especially when we are talking about small developers, because they don't understand how many API they have, could be to also have some maybe education or raise awareness or hold the IP rights that they can have and also how they can protect it. Because I don't know if you take that into consideration or it could be something really useful for them. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Shall we? Oh, okay, I can briefly answer that one. I think um, that that's an interesting one. And in, in fact, uh, there are a couple of things around IP, IP skills development, especially by WIPO. There are quite a lot of, let's say, new courses. Uh, I think one one of them is really focusing on video games, and there is a new one which is going to be around also. IP and um, skills for small entrepreneurs, which is going to be quite quite innovative as well, that's coming up next year. We are not necessarily recommending much on that. I think uh, the general recommendation on skills development can partly cover that. Uh, but I think we, we also partly cover that when with this sort of regulatory lighthouse, which is, I think, something really important to you and, and that could be also um, developed to further build capacity as well. So it could be beyond guidance at some point to go also to training and, and capacity building. But of course, it's a very different scale in terms of resources. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, you talked about a skill shortage for uh, the industry itself. Um, is there also a shortage for jobs, for people looking for a job in the industry? Because from my experience, I feel like it's kind of difficult to find a job in the game industry. And if that is the case, considering that lots of students are looking for people, but lots of people are not finding jobs in the industry, what does that mean for the quality of education? And what kind of actions can we take to improve that? No, you're totally right. I think it's, it's those students the employers were saying that those students with the right types of skills, uh, both in terms of technical skills and the, um, the softer skills, are the ones that they want and the ones that employ. Uh, that they employ. So, if there are um, difficulties for students to find it, it's because potentially they've got the, the wrong, potentially the wrong types of skills, or have gone on a course that isn't potentially practical, uh, which is which is across lots of different sectors. So I realise that really, but that's that was definitely the. The issue. So it wasn't that the um, supply of, of jobs was, was limited, it was just that sometimes the provision was producing not the wrong type of student, but a, a type of student that isn't as attractive than, than others. So, so, so yeah, I hope that's it. So it was definitely the, the quality of the provision rather than the quantity of either the provision or the jobs that were available.
I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, we've just talked about, is part of today and tomorrow as well. So partly, I think the organisers got us up front to sort of, at the beginning, just to sort of stimulate thought, really. So these things that we've talked about are, are fundamentally the, the main part of this, this event, really. So, i.e., you'll have a chance to discuss and debate all these issues.